When you hear Western use as an adjective to describe a novel or film or landscape, it likely conjures up a certain set of images, ideas, characters, iconography, and stories in your head. For many, there would likely be a shared set of reactions. However, as you dig into the Western as a genre of cultural productions, an incredibly diverse and often competing set of realities reveals itself. So what is a Western? This is the question we'll chew on in this episode of Writing Westward. I'm your host, Brennan Rensing. This month, we talk with Josh Garrett Davis, the Gamble Associate Curator at the Autry Museum of the American West, about his aptly named collection of essays, What is a Western? Region, Genre, Imagination. Thanks for listening. For new listeners, allow me to take a moment to explain a bit about Writing Westward and myself. Each episode features a conversation with people writing about the North American West. Historians, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, sociologists, and others. By showcasing their work, I hope to spark your curiosity to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the peoples who call it home. If a writer or topic intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brendan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation with me playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and everything else, all tasks for which I have no training. But I am passionate about the North American West, so this difficult work is well worth the excuse to read more books and talk to interesting people. At the end of each episode, I'll include a little bit more information about me and my scholarship and about the Red Center, our public programming and projects, and funding opportunities that you could apply for. With that, let me introduce a little bit more about today's guest and why we're talking to them. Josh Garrett Davis is the Gamble Associate Curator at the Autry Museum of the American West, author of multiple books and many public-facing shorter articles and pieces. He collected some of these and penned a number more for his richly illustrated essay collection, What is a Western? Region, Genre, Imagination, published by the University of Oklahoma Press in 2019. While Garrett Davis does not necessarily answer the titular question, his musings lead us toward a multiplicity of potential answers. How we might answer what is a Western, who it involves, what it looks like or sounds like, and most pressingly, what it means, can vary greatly from person to person and from era to era. As Garrett Davis reveals, the mediums and perspectives that have played with Western genres are incredibly diverse. Garrett Davis offers us glimpses at an illuminating array of the many potential paths to potential answers for this question, what is a Western? He blends investigations of music, film, art, literature, advertising, pop culture, academic resources, and other sources and artifacts, and introduces as many new questions while doing so as he answers, which is just the way I like it. So what is a Western? Well, It's complicated. I hope you enjoy furrowing your brow and scratching your chin as much as I did with this one. Josh Garrett Davis, welcome to Writing Westward. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to chat with you. Uh, I think you might be our first museum person we've had on the podcast, Uh, which I'm I'm really excited. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about your journey as a scholar that led you to become a curator at the Autry Museum of the American West? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I have kind of taken a winding path through a variety of um, different types of jobs. Um, I, but always kind of focused on the American West. Uh, after after college, I thought I wanted to be kind of a journalist and um, did an internship at High Country News and um, did a couple things for them. And then um, so, not too long after that, I guess I, I went and 
uh, got an MFA in nonfiction writing. Um, and I wrote a book that was kind of a memoir, but also kind of a regional essay exploration um, literary geography about the Great Plains. I grew up in South Dakota. And then I kind of, at some point after that, I was, I was sort of thinking, how am I going to have a sort of sustainable career? I don't know. I ended up deciding to go back to grad school again for history when I was 31. Uh, and not necessarily wanting to go into academia, but just in, in a way, just wanting to get the time and uh, sort of resources to write another book. And so I went into grad school with a kind of open-ended, like maybe I'll be a professor, maybe I'll work at a publisher, maybe I'll work at a museum, maybe I'll work, who knows? Um, and so that, I just kind of took one step from one step to the other. And then a, a little ways through grad school, I moved to Los Angeles for family reasons for my wife's purposes. And um, I became a member of the Autry Museum right away and I actually had done research at the, at the Autry before I even um, moved here. And so I just sort of started hanging around there. I live nearby. <laughs> And um, then I got a, the, the, I met some of the people who, the curators and, and such who worked there and sort of said, I'm around, you know, I thought maybe someday, 10 years from then, I might, maybe a job would open up there somewhere or something. But they turned out they needed a research assistant for a project um, relatively right away. And so I just did that for, you know, maybe 10 10 or 20 hours a week um, for a while. And then by kind of a grand coincidence that one of the curators left around that time. And so there was this job opening, so I applied for it and got it. So I, um, I have worked at museums in a couple of other capacities earlier in life, kind of as once as an internship and, and to really see a museum at my state historical society in South Dakota, but uh, I also worked just a day job at a museum in New York. So when I was in my twenties and trying to be a writer. So I didn't intend to become a museum professional, but, but I really enjoy it. Um, at some level, I still think of myself primarily as a writer in some way, but um, there's a lot of writing involved in museum work too. So that's the nutshell or maybe not quite, maybe more than a nutshell. It seems to fit you well, your writing style and the, the topics that you cover are eclectic to say the least. And uh, as I was reading, uh, there are various points where I could very much see this as a museum exhibit, not just because of all the, you know, it, the book is richly illustrated, lots of images, but just kind of this mishmash of all kinds of different things um, smashed together uh, in such a way, though, that they tell a story together that might otherwise be um, difficult to you know thread all these different things into a discernible theme or narrative but you do it well and, and you see that in museums and uh and, and and in your book as well um i was curious if uh your experience of curating exhibits and thinking about uh how to present you know physical objects uh, these, these cultural objects to the to the public how that influenced how you went about this doing this collection of essays yeah thank you um it it, it definitely i mean i have a ever evolving thinking about how exhibitions work and how museums work in terms of how as a kind of an art form or as a as a craft of you know, putting them together because it's such a fascinating thing to walk through an exhibit with somebody or or just eavesdrop and watch people in in an exhibit because you know they could be there on a date right and they're just talking and the museum objects are just sort of there to kind of as a backdrop they it might influence the conversation they might read five percent of what 
you've put up as far as text. Um, you but know, it's, a, I just watched... it's a venue for their date, not necessarily. Yeah, in some ways, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and hey, but but other people are, I mean, a very small portion of people are really focused and detail oriented and will read everything. Very, very, very small uh, percentage. And some people, you know, there's all these other things, but it, it was interesting. I just walked through, we had a film screening the other night and um, the filmmakers had obviously already seen their movie. So we, I walked them through the gallery while, while the film was showing. And we have an exhibition up, I didn't curate it, but um, is about kind of clothing and the sort of cultural meanings and historical meanings of clothing. And there's a section on um, Aloha shirts or Hawaiian, Hawaiian shirts that includes so, um, some of the kind of cultural ingredients that made up the Hawaiian shirt in its original form, which included a uh, surplus kimono fabric. And there's a kimono on display. And like this got them starting filmmakers. They started talking about Japanese cinema and <laughs> Kurosawa and um, in like, how does that sort of cycle into their conversation and, and stuff? So the upshot is sort of compared to a book or documentary or other sort of ways you might get a historical narrative across a museum you have way less control over what they take in and how it uh, functions uh, in their minds right and so letting go of that um, and being okay with that sort of um, kind of ping pong or not ping pong pinball uh, way that pe people's trains of thought go um, I think you can kind of see that in the book of, of at least that's my approach to, to museum work. I know some people are much more linear and sort of want to lead people from step A to B to C, but I'm much more in, in the pinball uh, approach. And you can kind of see that, that in the, in the way this book is structured. Yeah. There's somewhat of a free, there's, there's themes, but even within certain essays, there's kind of some free form narrative where it goes in very unexpected places um and you know you're, you're tying like you know geriatric heavy metal uh bands you know with uh with you know other stuff in the west and cowboy singers and yeah i can i could see that so you think that's um uh is this just kind of the way that you think and when you think about these topics that you like pulling things in from all kinds of different places and yeah, that is just the way I I like to think, at least when I'm being kind of more indulgent and, and creative. I mean, I have done and, and continue to do work that's much more straightforward and um, that's, you know, more about telling a discrete story of, you know, this, I did this research, here's what happened, here's what I think of it, or, you know, that, that that's, I still... Um, enjoy and continue to work in that kind of mode too but this book is like where I kind of let let it all go and sort of went went with um I think of it as kind of riffs on various things and a little bit is just the the book is a collection of things that I've written for different purposes some uh, maybe half of it or maybe a little more than half I wrote specifically for this book but some so the, it was kind of pulling together a lot of pieces, uh, maybe adapting them or changing them, but that I had written for other purposes. So, so something might be a book review. Well, I um, introduce a lot of films at the museum. And so some of them started as the introduction to a film. Um, and they had to be changed a lot to actually work as a chapter. But um, the, it was sort of looking at what I had what was missing? What could I add to that? And then in what way could I plausibly put an introduction conclusion to sort of, or sections and, and mm -hmm. kind of themes to bring it together? So, you know, there's definitely, I'm sure for various readers, there'd be chapters where it's just sort of, what, where did this one come from? Why is this one in here? This one, this, the, like, it, for one, per one person, it might be a different thing, but like this doesn't belong, or that, or whatever. So I tried to, to to build this sort of structure that where these things would hold together. But I wouldn't be surprised if um, there are some readers who who kind of find it and say like, 
whoa, this one is just out of nowhere. But I think that's part of the charm of it, though. You know, like like when you walk into a museum exhibit that you think is going to be about certain things and there's something unexpected there, it causes you to pause and to think and say, now, why is this here? Why does this fit? And maybe that leads you to some new kind of revelations about, you know, about the central theme of the exhibit. And so maybe the the unexpected moments in your book might might do the same because uh, it, it it does read kind of as a, a uh, as a museum exhibit where you you've you've curated some of these essays and pieces you've written for other things written some new things and pulled it all together um and uh, pulled it all together for a central purpose you know you the book's title you know is a question what is a western and um your big picture answer seems to be um it's complicated <laughs> right you the by the, this question opens many more doors than it closes, uh, which I, I always gravitate towards that kind of work. I don't like things that try to come up with clear cut answers because I don't know if I quite believe in that for most things. Um, so um, I, I'm curious about uh, when I think when most people would pick up the, the title or see the title, what is a Western? Or if I was just to go out on the street and ask people, hey, what is a Western? Most people would go first to film. I think they're like, oh, a Western? A Western is a genre of film. Um, why do you think that is where people's minds go first when they hear this phrase, a Western? I mean, that is sort of the seat of the book, and it's it's a portion of sort of my whole journey at the Autry um, since I started there, and I've been there about um, six years. <clears throat> um, because I came to topics of the American West as somebody who was from kind of the edge of the American West and South Dakota. Um, and then my first kind of encounter with it academically was um, in a literature class in college that was about memoirs of people from the American West that was, this was in the late 90s, um, you know, uh, things that I don't know, Wallace Stegner or uh, Leslie Marmon Silko, Maxine Hong Kingston, these writers where the Western genre in the sense that the person on the street that you interview, it touches, the, like there's glancing kind of ways in which those that type of literature is Western in the sense that the person on the street um, kind of might think. Uh, as one of my colleagues puts it, sort of cowboys and cactus, sort of um, as a shorthand. Um, but it's not really the heart of that. And I honestly didn't, I have, had not seen that many Western proper, kind of very strictly Western films. Uh, you know, I've been to, I've, I've, you know, I've, I saw the things on reruns somewhat or, or whatever, but it just wasn't for, for our generation. It's not that central. Right. Um, Maybe the generation previous. Yeah. Right. And so then I come to the Autry, which, you know, founded by Gene, Gene Autry. Autry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and in Los Angeles where what the West means is even more sort of associated with these backlots on the studios and a certain, yeah. yeah in Hollywood. And I start having to sort of introduce movies or, or help select movies for our film series or think about, um, you know, a lot of this book comes out of the thinking toward this renovation of one of our core long-term galleries uh, at the museum, which is the pop culture gallery, which was a kind of history of the genre that, that we're talking about. So I just sort of started to think of how do these things relate? Cause I, and I'm, you know, member of the Western History Association, which doesn't really connect that much with the Western genre. Um, I, you know, I've, how did these, the Western, as I kind of thought of it coming to uh, the, the adjective Western versus the sort of what I do say in the book, a kind of capital W Western uh, of what a lot of people picture in relation to film. How do those things relate? And that's sort of the frame I ended up finding for, to hold all these disparate essays together in the book. 
was because there, there's not a clean line between them. Um, so, you know, I, I even think of like the Western History Association was, it wasn't founded like in Frederick Jackson Turner's time or something. It was founded in the 60s, I think, in the heyday of the Western genre in film, right? And how much of it was built on the popularity and sort of centrality of that genre to American identity at that time. Um, so even like acad an academic history organization is profoundly touched by that yeah. or shaped by that genre. Um, you know, the, the Autry has had all sorts of exhibits over the years that have um, nothing to do with the Western genre. Like even I, I keep learning about things they did in even the early years where you wouldn't maybe have thought they would of like a show about Japanese internment or um, shows about sort of LA history in certain ways or things like that. They didn't have the trappings of kind of the mythologized frontier West. <laughs> right. But when, when you put them in that museum, it can't help but sort of have some echoes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what, that was sort of the, that's a long way of answering that. But <laughs> um, it, I, I was just sort of trying to grapple with what, how, how does this, how does the West as a real place full of real people um, with all these stories, both fictional and non-fictional that, that are told here, interface with this this <laughs> behemoth of a kind of genre that is known all over the world um, and um, is associated with that place. And how do we live and tell stories within that, um, that kind of weird um, limbo between those things? I don't know if there's many other regions in the U.S. that are so, and not just so mythologized, but that um, like, I don't know, like what would an Eastern novel be? I, I don't know what that would mean uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a Southern one, maybe there's some, there's some mm -hmm. kind of understood mythology there. Um, but when you say this, let's, I wrote a book, it's a novel, it's a Western novel that conjures up for people a lot more so than I think in other regions and the popular culture, be it through film or art or all the associated art that comes, you know, with all these pop culture things has really, um, really defined how people think about the region. Um, yeah. Um, but you do um, talk at various points, though, that uh, it depends on when we're talking. I mean, at one point, I think maybe it's just an introduction. You say if you had added uh, the word now mm -hmm. to the title, what is a Western now? That might be a very different discussion than what was a Western in the late 19th century or various points in the 20th century. So talk to us about the kind of this evolution of how people have viewed Western as a genre for art, literature, film, whatever uh, we're talking about. How, how has that evolved over the past hundred plus years? Yeah, I mean, it it really has changed. And I mean, there is something about the post-war Western of Hollywood, of the studio system and that moment that, and, and TV, when TV came out and it totally dominated TV. It had a, it had a saturation level in the culture that it probably didn't, it didn't have really before that at that level and it hasn't had since and probably won't. Um, so there's something about that that kind of dominates our consciousness. But actually, if you look back, I mean, uh, you know, the earlier kind of iterations of the Western would be kind of these dime novels in the 19th century, um, which are kind of seen as, you know, kind of bad influence literature for young boys, you know, <laughs> that they're reading about violence and and kind of they're, they're risque in various ways and they're, they're sort of and, and at that point, the cowboy was not um, a heroic figure, right, for middle class proper people. It was a kind of, he was kind of dirty and, and a, kind of a, um, I don't know, 
you know, just a, a sort of an unseemly or un, improper in some ways character, not a role model. Yeah. Um, and then you sort of have Wild West shows um, where the cowboys do start to become heroes and, and that, that influence of that on Teddy Roosevelt, um, you know, the, and perhaps connected to sort of other, or, you know, what, art and all those things it sort of started to become associated with a national identity in certain ways. Um, but I, one thing I like about, as I've learned more about Wild West shows, is just how much more there was to them and how weird they were <laughs> that you would have like elephants in the Wild West show or you would have acrobats um, or there were people from, they would have, you know, a race of a gaucho against a cowboy mm -hmm. or, you know, um, and some Cossacks, right? From Cossack, like the, yeah, Cossack or, um, rider, Cossacks, trick riders yeah. from Eastern Europe. Yeah, uh, you, yeah, you have, you know, it was sort of, it's, it's fascinating, you know, that it's, it's, in, and in some ways that a lot of that kind of diversity and kind of just weirdness, for lack of a better word, uh, fell out a little bit. But then, you know, if you think about film. There was sort of, I don't know, the, the silent film era. I'm trying to think of how to characterize it. It's, it's definitely like a clean cut. Like there's not dust on the cowboy shirt. There's not, you know, he's, he's a hero, um, but in this very proper kind of spick and span way. Yeah. And then kind of in as sound came in having the singing cowboys and you know watching these movies like gene autry and 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 so on i have, i keep being surprised how they kind of take place in the present not in a kind of 19th century like there'll be cars and airplanes alongside like racing against a horse a cowboy and a horse or and it it i don't know if I guess it was kind of framed as basically happening in the present, but in this kind of mythological present where, where there were these cowboys with rhinestone shirts yeah. um, um, doing heroic deeds uh, and singing songs every now and then. Um, and, and so the, the, there's a lot that's sort of interesting in that before the kind of classic era of like John Ford type Westerns, like there's a lot to draw from um there's kind of there's there's some cross genre uh westerns that are really fascinating of like um you know gene autry's first starring role was in a serial called the phantom empire where it's kind of a sci-fi thing where there's a there's these aliens kind of twenty thousand leagues below the ranch kind of thing and you mm -hmm. go down and, and he's fighting against these kind of robot aliens um figures and um there's horror kind of westerns there's um there's so there were independent filmmakers with uh, making films all african-american casts doing uh westerns and bill pickett was in a couple of yeah yeah western um so there's sort of a lot going on in in these early whether it's sort of acrobats in in the wild west show or sort of this kind of different types of stories within the pre-war westerns that kind of got flattened in in memory and when we think about um we just think john ford we just think john ford right yeah, yeah. but it was a, maybe a more diverse at the time a much more diverse genre yeah but for a lot um, of them is it a fair statement to say that for a lot of these especially with some of those john ford ones that the western as a genre became the stage on which uh you know, contemporary Americans were kind of acting out national creation myths and uh, narratives. And I mean, there's, you know, there's Westerns which are clearly not about the 1800s in the West, but they're about, you know, civil rights things. They're about World War II, you know, but, but in Western trappings, right? So it becomes the stage on which the nation can just play out all of its stories, whether or not those stories actually take place in the West or not, right? For sure. Like, I mean, we, you know, something like um, the film Broken Arrow, um, it, where it's sort of seen as one of the early of that post-war kind of sympathetic to Indians kind of film. But it really feels to me when I watched it, um, 
felt to me like it's kind of about diplomacy and the uh, emergence of the UN and kind of this kind of post-war things about sort of negotiating um, with other nations in some sense. (laughs) Like that's what I I kind of hear. And, and, you know, I think with, yeah, John John Ford's, um, even a lot of John Ford's films are kind of about present day things of, whether it's race, gender, uh, manhood, civil rights, whatever, there, there's a lot. Yeah, they, they they very much feel, a lot of them very much feel like they're, it's pretty close to the surface how much they're about present day kind of cultural, political, yeah, very, national very concerns. thinly veiled. Mm-hmm. Um, as we get into the latter 20th century, you know, the, the genre gets deconstructed quite a bit. And, you know, post-Western films and literature, which are very consciously deconstructing this frontier cowboy and Indian mythology. Um, mm-hmm. You say that when you when you approach new exhibits at the Autry, you, you, got, you have to think about addressing some of the mythologized West, but also approaching it, I think the word you use is slantwise, uh, <laughs> like also then trying to highlight the other angles in which we could look at at the genre of the region. Um, I think it, when, I, when I teach about what, you know, pop culture and the mythic West, I think this is the funnest way to do it is by looking at all these deconstructions or mm-hmm. unexpected takes on, on the region. Um, now, I've heard people who teach, I, I, I haven't taught this stuff yet, but I've heard pe- people who teach talk about how a lot of students now don't really click with the John Ford films as much that there's other films from that era that that they are more interested in that the, the, the other just, westerns from the era yeah other westerns like bud bedeker uh the um like the tall t uh, there's there's other that are kind of that were maybe less successful at the time or that didn't get sort of canonized as much um, and what's different about them that you see some new young audiences liking more i I think that they are more they're less sort of heroic i guess in a sense like that they're um more bleak and more sort of artistic a little bit in a in a different way like john ford's he's he was an artist of, of a very high caliber but just sort of there's a certain straightforward um heroism there that i think is hard maybe to relate to at this point often Um, very um static clear moralities mm -hmm. um and just very black and white issues which isn't how the world generally operates so do you think some of these ones that are a little more nuanced a little grittier maybe a little more um not not necessarily subversive but um less less clear in who good guys and bad guys are uh, right the anti-hero yeah. you know that 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 maybe speaks to the current generation or even even your, yeah. yours and my generation yeah, yeah exactly exactly i think it is sort of um and and but i i there's also points in the book where i talk a bit nostalgically that like i sort of I, it's impossible for me to, and probably for you to sort of look at heroes in that way as like these sort of unblemished, almost semi-godlike kind of um, figures. But I, I sort of lament that in a, in a certain way, um, not to be reactionary, but just to sort of think, um, you know, it's, it's not a, um, it's a pretty common observation that a lot of our sort of civic um, institutions are kind of breaking down and, and people kind of don't want to like be on the school board that much or, or be kind of the, all those kind of institutions like the kind of 
clubs like the Elks or whatever, Kiwanis, yeah, you yeah. know, they, those are all just falling apart. Churches are, you know, losing attendance. All these things are kind of, and I sort of connect to those things in my mind a little bit in the sense that is it, is it possible or is it possible to sort of, or is there something about having those kind of um, epic heroes that, is good for us in some sense. Mm-hmm. but it's like i can't i can't actually do it and i can't actually buy into it but it, it's sort of <laughs> a um so even it, if it's bad history having someone up on a pedestal for a society it is a way that a society can say here's our ideal here's what we're shooting for yeah so it's bad history but maybe there is some cultural value there that maybe is we're missing now yeah, so I think there's there's these sort of moments I think in this book where I'm, I, I sort of see because I, I you know I speak with a lot of older folks who are fans of the genre who who do have that um, ideal in some ways and um, it, you know so I I really respect that in a lot of ways uh, even though I am a sort of <laughs> jaded kind of gen x slash millennial whatever person so um yeah so so it's sort of a hard uh thing and i think that the western genre is a kind of good place to kind of grapple with that uh because you have like um you know you have a a gene autry who never loses a fight or whatever um and never shoots first and you know is respectful and all these things and then you kind of you know, a lot of, if you think about, I don't know, Red Dead Redemption or something yeah. like the, you, if you're the hero of that, you're not like stick and spin at all. No. Um, <laughs> so you're, you you can shoot first and you know, all that and sort of what does that sort of mean? So <laughs> a few, I think it was last year at some point we had um, Sarah Humphreys on to talk about her book, Manifest Destiny 2.0, talking about mm-hmm. Red Dead Redemption and, you know, Western video games and how they are kind of deconstructing the genre or or augmenting it somehow. Um, what are let's let's kind of pivot a little bit and then or go deeper into some of these things that you write about in the book that kind of disrupt or uh, challenge some of that mytho- mythologized nature of of the genre, not just for films but for for other stuff as well. Um, mm-hmm. One, uh, I mean, just to stay on film for a moment, I, I I always love reading about foreign westerns, foreign language westerns. I mean, speaking of how America was projecting the stories it wanted to tell on this western genre, uh, foreign countries and other cultures were also then have have used the western genre to tell stories they wanted to tell. What, what are some mm-hmm. of some of your favorite ones that really? add bizarre wrinkles into how we think about the genre. Yeah, I've been really um, excited to learn more. Of course, I had heard about like spaghetti westerns, and um, Karl May's uh, German westerns and things like that. Um, but since I've been at the museum, I've kind of collected, people just keep telling me about new, new iterations of this where I didn't, know it existed or um sort of expect it um and i mean one example that i I cite briefly in the in the book and um was able to when we started doing zoom programming at the beginning of covid started doing interviews and was able to interview this historian um didier gondola who's at um Indiana University, it's like the Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis, Mm -hmm. um, an African historian. He wrote a book about, um, in Kinshasa and the Congo, this youth movement um, in the 1950s at the sort of, at at that point, it was still the colonial Belgian Congo. um, And it was kind of these urban tough kids, teenagers, um, dressing up as uh, as cowboys um, with the kind of you know, Roy Rogers style of clothes. And I'm not sure how they got there. They called themselves Les Bill, the Bills after Buffalo Bill. Um, and what was and, their message by, by doing this? Like, 
by I mean, perf- I think, but this kind of performative identity what was the point yeah i think performing masculinity in a, in a when the, in the colonial context and they're sort of emasculated though there were there were young women involved too who were also kind of performing a kind of masculinity um and it, it's like an agency like they, they there were these accounts of these open air screenings of imported westerns um where people would just sort of cheer at the at the violence and, and just a sort of like get, you know the power to fight sort of back and and um i guess maybe how people think of martial arts movies or, or you know kind of crime the various kind of crime movies or whatever but that it gave you this sort of agency in this context when the, you know really oppressive sort of colonial regime i mean the belgian regime is so it was kind of an anti-colonial in in a thing, way but in in a, in a you know these are still teenagers like yeah. basically um being cool and being you know being tough um but they ended up playing a big role as he he argues in the book in um uh, there was a kind of big uprising. I, I don't remember all the details of where where they kind of accelerated this, and um, Belgium ended up sort of giving, um, I guess, became Zaire or sort of independence a, earlier than than kind of they had planned on. They had planned on this really long kind of interim of decolonization that sort of and the, 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 this kind of uprising of kind of urban uprising kind of accelerated. Like they're going to get out of there. Um, and and sort of, you know, the Western genre only kind of plays a bit part in that, but it was just like fascinating that that's the vocabulary that they chose um, to enact their resistance in that way. Yeah. Um, I like showing, yeah. before I've shown students clips from some of the East German communist Westerns, mm-hmm. some people call them Kraut Westerns. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll always check to see if anyone can speak German because it kind of spoils the fun of it. But uh, playing them a clip uh, where without subtitles and then having them try to figure out like w- what it is that's going on, because in these East German ones, uh, the roles are often flipped, right? The cow, the capitalist cowboys are, of course, the villains in these <laughs> communist made Westerns and the native peoples are often the heroes. Yeah. And it's fun watching students faces as they're trying to like th- they're going into this with a set. I with some set characters and what they think is happening. And as we watch the clip, they start to, it slowly dawns on them. Oh, wait, the Cowboys aren't the good guys here, are they, right? And then we have a whole discussion about why. But again, yeah. you know, this for, this foreign uh, country uh, telling a story it wants to tell uh, with Western vocabulary in a way. Yeah, it's it, there's so many kind of... Um amazing kind of versions of this and then and in a more sort of playful way you see like <clears throat> if you watch k-pop videos now of some of the really big groups that are some of the more popular <laughs> artists in the world right now of pop, pop music there's tons of westerns um really within these yeah and it's done in the kind of i i see echoes of more of the gene autry Roy rogers mm-hmm. sort of stylized um blingy fashion version and mixing it with other genres like all over the place you kind of you see it become this it, you know in some ways it's just a shorthand visual trope but why does it keep yeah. living on and in this you know one of the most popular genres in the world right now so even if even if they don't like con- they're not making a conscious statement about like what this western you know fashion or whatever it means it it has some kind of cultural cachet or power even if they're not defining what it is right but but the iconography right m- means something and so right. you mishmash it with some other stuff and <laughs> yeah it, it, it lends some kind of weight or power or yeah huh i i always i also often <laughs> i've let students for extra credit watch Speaking of Korea, there's a really great Korean Western called The Good, The Bad, The Weird. Oh, yeah. I've, I haven't seen it, but I've wanted to it's screen like it. It's yeah. like every Western tro- movie trope mm-hmm. dialed up to 11. Just, But, but I think consciously, just yeah. over the top. Um, but it's in Manchuria. And yeah. with like, uh, I think it's like Korean nationalists fighting against the Chinese and stuff. It's 
but there's a tr like the whole opening say you know, sequence like 10 15 minutes long it's a train robbery <laughs> but like going back to like the very origins of moving pictures right uh, right and and westerns um uh let, maybe we um I mean, there's just again because your book is so eclectic and what it talks about <laughs> it's hard to decide um maybe let's talk about fashion so you mentioned that some of these k-pop groups are like, well and these these teenage kids in in Belgian Congo, you know, we're dressing <laughs> kind of in Western. I can see right now you're wearing a nice pearly snap yeah. Western yeah, shirt. I, I have I have some pearly snap shirts. Um uh I wear them though, and I don't know if you do, maybe with a a hint of irony. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of it's turned into hipster fashion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So whereas previously Western fashion maybe was a way to perform masculinity, when hipsters of our generation put on a pearly snap shirt. I, I think it means something very different. How, how do we unpack that? <laughs> Good question. This shirt, I'm, I've had it for a long time. I got it at a Salvation Army or something. But That's right. Interesting. Most of mine too. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's not like a Wrangler shirt. It's weirdly from the Gap from maybe the early 80s or late 70s. And the Gap was like a, it has like an old Gap logo on the tag, which is fascinating. And it says Fashion Pioneers and it has a copper wagon on the tag. It's so weird. Um, I, I'm sure it would have been would be worth a lot more money now, but I got it for two dollars in the Salvation Army universe. Um, so there were hipster, obviously, kind of version, uh, you know, maybe whatever San Francisco in 1982 or whatever uh, is probably some sort of earlier version of that, like a hipster sort of performative thing. That's not necessarily it's ironic in some way, I think. Um, and I sort of have a hard time imagining that someone wearing a nudie suit is you know with rhinestones and kind of amazing chain stitch embroidery is performing masculinity in the same way that like john wayne in a kind of dusty bib shirt or uh is that called a bib shirt? and uh, you know it's sort of well it's like in back to the future three right where yeah. <laughs> marty mcfly goes back but he's decked out like gene autry and people are like yeah. what and anyway. Yeah, what, what is this? <laughs> I also, I want to put out a call if anyone knows where that shirt is. That it's like got atoms on it. Like it's it's a fifties thing, so it has like nuclear like atoms as the embroidery on it. And I was like, where is that shirt? Because that's perfect. You know, they they're like, is it um, not on display in an exhibit I, I, somewhere? We don't have a copy. I, I don't know who has a copy of that shirt, but I, I would love to borrow it or, or have it in a museum collection. Yeah, the, um, ato the atomic meets the at exactly uh, Cowboy West. Um, but yeah, so it's, 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 I mean, I think like all of this stuff, it's very malleable, right? Like, so it, you know, there's versions of um, Western wear that are still enacting um, probably a more conservative rural um, aesthetic or, or values, right? Of um, uh, When a city kid like me puts on that same shirt, it, yeah. It means something different. Right. I don't know what I mean, but when I put them on. Yeah, I'm not um, sure I do e either. It's just for me, I'm like, well, I have to. Well, within the museum context, it's sort of, you know, kind of. Um, I see it a little bit as like carrying on a little a torch of some kind um, with a wink, of course, um, because basically nobody else in the Autry staff, I would say, maybe a couple, one or two people maybe wear, wear some Western wear, but it's it's very few at this point. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll help, you know, tend this little <laughs> ember of yeah, pearl. Yeah, that's your oh, thing. An ember of pearl snaps. Yeah, uh, yeah. so. I once, yeah, went to a, I once went to a rodeo and I was wearing a shirt that was, it was a t-shirt, but had screen printed on it like pearly snaps and like some like the roses like embroidery nice. and it was just all screen printed on and some pe some of them thought it was really great and a couple of them looked like they wanted to beat me up wow because they thought <laughs> i was making fun of them which was not yeah. my in intention um <laughs> yeah I, I mean it's part of i don't know i mean i i kind of associate it in when I'm kind of thinking of what I'm wearing, I'm, I am a little bit hearkening to, I, there's a, uh, uh, chapter in the book about 
you mentioned like about heavy metal, but it's also about um, the kind of outlaw country era of the seventies or, or so with like Waylon and Willie. And, and to some degree, I feel like I'm reaching for that a little bit when I'm going into Western fashion in that it's kind of, um, there's a sort of version of Westernness, quote unquote, for, that from that era where it's kind of gruff, but kind of progressive. Um, well, maybe this is calling way redneck. back to like you were saying, this harkens back to those dime novel days when maybe the, the cowboy was a little bit of a shady character and right, not this spick and span, clean cut hero. Um, but a little gruff and dirty around the edges, like out, outlaw country of the 70s. Right. Right? It harkens kind of that same thing. So maybe <laughs> maybe that's the vibe that you're going for. A little, yeah, a little counterculture, like, a little edge. Yeah, exactly. There's a little counterculture, a little edge. And also I think like to try to, you know, as, as someone who's at least kind of quasi-academic and kind of like, I, I don't want to like wear a suit and project kind of, authority in that way when I'm mostly working with uh, a, a public where that's kind of off-putting in the sense and just because of who I am because I came out of like punk rock uh, world and stuff as a, as a teenager and stuff so I'm not, I like wouldn't wear a suit anyway in that way so so I'm just sort of like well okay so what is you know what's a so I mean it's not I'm, I'm not always wearing western wear by any means but it's definitely I you know one ingredient i guess yeah. in my my closet so i mean we're kind of running out of time but um with all of these various things that are complicating what the genre is in film and literature and art um i mean you, you write a lot about uh native wests and kind of uh, you know various native artists who've reinvented the western uh, for themselves. Um, you talk about historic and more contemporary Black Westerns, or like these Tarantino Westerns, which are their own thing. Or I think about uh, Jordan Peele's Get Out, uh, not Get Out, sorry, Nope, which nope, just came yeah. out, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I, I'm waiting for someone to write a really smart article about that as a Western or anti-Western. Mm -hmm. So so what's the the future of this genre of cultural production? Mm -hmm when it seems like from every angle there are things trying to deconstruct it reinvent it um what 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 does the the genre do moving forward does yeah it cease, I mean, does it cease to be something discernible or is there something there at its core that is stable enough that people can play with it and mess around with it as much as they want and it will still endure as something discernible yeah i mean i think that if it was going to die out it would have died out already like i don't think it's going anywhere um in terms of just being abandoned as a as a genre vocabulary um in and, and there are many there are accounts of you know people saying oh the western is played out or it's over you know going back to the 20s i think um so I think it's going to continue to evolve in interesting ways. And I, I think it is, at, at least at the moment, it, it, I don't want to predict necessarily where it will go, but at the moment it is very much, it seems like that mixed up way where it's mixed with horror, or it's mixed with um, K-pop kind of pop or- um, Or to the Star Wars universe. Or to the Star Wars Westerns. universe. Yeah, like a Mandalorian or, um, but there's still sort of, there conscious all those people are consciously referring to something like they they, they have clearly chosen to engage with it um and yeah so i, I think it's just um I, and and i think the the you know as a i i sort of am trying to figure out what the museum equivalent is in in, this, in that sense of like what is our how can we make exhibitions that work as well as a lot of those films do or those TV shows or, or music or whatever. And, and that people want to come to that speak to the current generation. Right. But still impart some kind of knowledge and right. And yeah. Wisdom it's a, or, or so, you know, I've almost since I started the Autry, I've been 
planning and, um, you know, and planning and planning and building uh, f- to redo this pop culture gallery, um, which was a kind of line of mannequins of all the store. And, and there were various reasons, but some just sort of for conservation, some of that stuff had been on display too long, uh, the lighting needs to be changed, all these kind of logistical reasons. But thematically, yeah, how do we, how do we rethink what is a Western now? And so we, we're hopefully we'll be opening it, fingers crossed in, in May of next year. Um, but it's been a long, it's a long process. I guess it's not that different from making a film in some ways, um, a sort of development process. And, and hopefully, you know, pulling from what we have in the collection and, and different sort of um, stories that we can tell make a, an exhibition sort of that is parallel to the, the sensibility of what the Western seems to be now. Um, and it, with a bit more of kind of an educational twist, but it, it tries to be very playful and fun too. Like there's a lot of sort of um, play and, and an encouragement of visitors to make their own version of it to sort of, whether it's in their conversation in the gallery or on their TikTok feed or on uh, it, if they're an artist of some kind, you know, just to make your own version of the story and that, that works. And that's the, that's the sort of hope is that um, there are these, for me, I like that there are so many wonderful versions and there are very earnest and kind of, you know, I talk at this sort of, at the end of the book, um, I'm a huge fan, I, I guess the sort of my own, in some ways, my own tastes or whatever type of movies I really like uh, two Western filmmakers that really speak to, to me on that are Chloe Zhao, and, who made Nomadland and The Rider and others, and, um, and Kelly Reichardt, who's been working longer, who made, I mean, most sort of classically Western, she made Meek's Cutoff and First Cow last year or year before, mm-hmm. and, but has made many modern films set in the West, including a really disturbing kind of eco-terrorism movie called uh, Night Moves. And, you know, that just has explored the West in this very slow, quiet, indie movie way um, that I really like. And th- that's another version that's sort of totally opposite of K-pop, like three minute video that with a cut every half second, you know. Um, a slow but, art house indie movie. <laughs> yes, very slow. I mean, we I once did a... Uh, panel at WHA with the writer who worked on several of her films. Um, gosh, I'm spacing on his name. Um, but he he referred to, I think, Meek's cutoff as like punishingly artistic. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a good way. I mean, in a good way, but I, I kind of like that, you know. So it's a, I, like a three-minute shot with no cut, you know, or something like that. You know, it's just like, whoa. It, it's it's powerful in its own way, too. So I, I like I like all of it, though. You know, I, I just I like that all of that is happening and giving this kind of wider scope of the region and the genre. Well, it speaks to the genre's, you know, dynamism and durability that it, yeah, I mean, it can withstand people doing all kinds of unexpected things with it and still, yeah. still be something identifiable. Uh, well, what are, you want to give us a peek at what you're beyond this exhibit, which yeah. hopefully is coming uh, in 2023. Uh, yes. What else are you working on, say, as a writer? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm kind of this, I, you know, taking this job at the museum and um, then taking on this book project were, you know, maybe not advisable things in terms of from my academic perspective of like finishing my dissertation and <laughs> publishing that. Um, I did sort of finally, it, it ended up taking me nine years to finish the PhD and I, I finished in 2020 and so now I'm kind of coming back to that work which is a it's a more straightforward history uh of Native American engagements with sound media it's um recording and radio principally uh in in the 20th century from the late 19th century up to up till the the end of around the end of the 20th century um with a you know a few case studies along the way of that so I'm, I'm writing that much more as a straightforward history um and um, so hopefully, I don't know. Sometime. 2025, 2026, <laughs> somewhere in there, it'll, it'll be um, uh, be done and out there. So Well, there, it's in, kind of in the zeitgeist. You know, there's that Rumble documentary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gray, that was great. And there's a documentary about um, 
death metal on the Navajo reservation, wasn't it? Yes, there was. Yeah. So, so, so you're, you're, you're part, you're part of these conversations. That's, <laughs> yes, that's awesome. I, 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 yep. Very, very much. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great stories there. And obviously I can only tell some of them, but yeah, there's a, I'm writing about some of the early native owned labels um, earlier than I would have thought back in the forties um, in their early radio shows and then tribal radio stations and, and and so on as that evolved through through the 20th century. So, oh, that's great. It's, it'll be um, and and there will probably be some exhibition version or a parallel to that that's still kind of in the planning or imagining phases at this point. Great. Well, uh, good luck balancing a full time job <laughs> at the Autry, you know, revising that dissertation into a book form and everything that goes with that. It's a well, thank you. Yeah, it's a it process. is. It's a process, but you know, it's, I'm happy to have a cool job and to, you know, be, be doing projects and getting to continue to write and do, do all these things. So it's, um, I'm grateful for it, even though there's a lot to juggle. So, well, we're grateful for your work. Uh, and I Thank really, you. really enjoyed the book. Thanks for having me on. All right. Take care, Josh. <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll subscribe and listen every month. Please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through. Or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We're an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understandings about the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream, have an annual funding cycle with award, grant, and fellowship categories that nearly anyone researching or working on the region from any disciplinary approach or towards any final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D Center. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Dahl, Anderson, with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, and just about everything else, so you can direct any praise or critique my way. I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. Recently, my book, Native But Foreign, Indigenous Immigrants and Refugees in the North American Borderlands, published by Texas A&M University Press in 2018, won the Best Historical Nonfiction Book Award from the Western Writers of America. In an anthology I co-edited with P. Jane Hafen, entitled Essays on American Indian and Mormon History, published by the University of Utah Press in 2019, won the Metcalf Best Anthology Book Prize from the John Whitmer Historical Association. Here at the Red Center, I'm also general editor and project manager of a great digital history, uh, public history project named Intermountain Histories. It's a free mobile app and website, uh, intermountainhistories.org, that curates student-researched and written micro-histories of the region, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, or anything else, head to bwrensink, that's R-E-N-S-I-N-K, dot org, or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind. Cheers. <laughs>